Thank you. And thank you for coming. And I'm really excited tonight to have um, East Point Church. They have been their Vancouver Church, and they've been a real help to us getting going here as well. And Pastor Stephen has been such an encouragement to us. So I just want to hand over to Pastor Stephen and the team. And I believe this choir has been out of oh, years and years. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
exactly going to come up, and we're going to spend um, two songs like the first song of the week forever. And the card is coming to the line. We're glad to be here with all of you in worship. We're a holy God, and even though we set apart and he's holy, we still have personal God. The God of our baptism is able to come and worship him. And that's what we want to do in this single night, is to worship our God and to raise Him to the highest things. And that's what we're going to do in this song.
about the faithfulness of our God. And I know we are quite young as a church. Uh, we are a few years just ahead of you, but we can testify that over the last six years, God has been faithful to us as individuals, but has been very faithful to us as a church. And we want to give God the glory because God has been with us each step of the way. And we pray that the Lord will bless your fellowship and your fellowship will grow and help people in this area come to faith and come to know the knowledge of the faithfulness of God.
and I must have come and answered to tonight we really do appreciate that. Thank you, Good evening, everyone. We moved to Bellingham whenever I was three years old, so I've lived in Bellingham most of my life. Um, I just like, couldn't grow up in a better place. Um, <laughs> where we lived, we were surrounded by lovely Christian people. We just seemed to be all our neighbours were Christians. And just a new year, like the years, all the neighbours had all been praying for us. Um, but there was a lady who I used to go to her house called Helen Lee. And she lived in Colrod's Drive in Bellingham as well. And she used to have wee meetings in her house. Um, she used to tell us all the Bible stories and teach us all the songs. <coughs> and of course, she always got a wee sweet at the end. Um, it was there that I first got saved, and I was probably only about maybe seven or eight. Um, but I thought if you'd done something bad that week, then you had to go back the next week and get saved again. I just didn't really understand there. Um, but I remember, I always remember, she had this children's Bible. Um, there was middle pages and it was Moses part in the Red Sea and that, that just always stuck with me, you know, throughout the years. Um, and I remember Christmas asking Santa to bring me the children's Bible and he did bring it for me but I believe it was Helen who had ordered it for all the parents, you know, and everybody had got, got these for Christmas. Um, so, sorry. So whenever I was younger, I used to think that being a Christian was just a lot of rules. You know, you have to follow, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't be cheeky, don't go to the cinema, and you certainly don't be going about having a good time. <laughs> so me and my sister, Kim and Marty, we're very close, and we had a great time growing up. We used to always sing all the wee songs. One was washing the dishes, one drying the dishes, one putting away, and we're all singing. Just all the wee choruses that we learned. Um, <coughs> They used to always try and sneak off without being said I was scared, but my mum used to make them take back. Um, we used to go to um, the Pentecostal on the Cumber Road on a Sunday night, and there was, I think we went, there was one of the fellas inside there who played Elvis. We all just used to start on that Pentecost. But anyway, whenever we used to come home to meet Kim and Matt, like, um, Kim always had the baby, we used to play like the gospel, you know, the them singing. So Kim, she was always on the piano, Mandy was on the guitar, sometimes she put her school blazer on back to the front, she had to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I was given a tablet box, and that was my tambourine, I just used to have to stand and shake it. Um, but my mommy, she started going to church, but it was my daddy who got saved first in 1988, and then a few months later, my mommy followed. Um, but mostly everybody in Valley Bing, we didn't need my daddy because he was a bit of a, a bad rascal could say. Um, and every whenever everyone heard that he had got saved, they were all going, Oh, he'll never sit that, Jim, we're in the way, he'll not do you out of drink. But he did, and you know, in our whole family we started to see the change in my daddy, you know, and he was always saying, Come on, you just need to get saved, you just need to get go to church and you just need to do this and that we've just like rolled the eyes and went, Yeah, we're going to the discos and bangor, we had no time for this church. Um, but it was just a complete change in our whole family. And when you know when Daddy can sit and read his wee Bible and he had his music going, you know, but he was always going on, he didn't get saved. Um, so sorry. Yeah, so I went to Bellingham Primary School at the end of the time and then I left school at 16 and started to work in Fisher Valley. It was a seatbelt factor. But even when I was worked there, there was a wee lady called Darren and she was a Christian. You know, she was always telling us wee Christian scriptures and singing wee songs to us. And even one time I went to the Grand Canyon for Marie Curie and teamed up with a man from Bambridge called Frank. Well, Frank was a Christian as well, you know, and he was going through the Grand Canyon singing all these songs. It just seemed I was always surrounded by lovely Christian people. Um, so I got married in 1987 <coughs> who I had been going with from when I was 15. Um, I was blessed with two beautiful daughters, Asia and India, but my marriage failed. Um, there was just a lot of hate and a lot of anger there. But I'm not going to go into that tonight because it's not really about that. It's about more what God has brought me through and how good he's been through me throughout the years. Um, but even when I didn't realise that God was being just really good to me, 
and getting things out of my life that weren't meant to be there, people who weren't meant to be there, and things that were happening. I always seemed to have God looking out for me. But I always had this like a lonely, lonely feeling. Um, I lived at home at my house with my two daughters, but I was really, really lonely and just, just I, I couldn't be in a place like this and just always had this real lonely feeling. And that's what I used to call it, a lonely feeling. Uh, and no matter what I was doing, it was just always, I always used to feel, oh, I want to go home to my mummy and daddy because they'll give me a hug and I, I just want to be home with mummy and daddy. But I couldn't because I had two kids in my own that had to be an adult. So, um, so, so I started going back then, it was probably like in the early 90s, um, went to the church with my mummy and daddy. But really, I was only going there for company because I just thought I need to get out of the house and I would go there, there would be people to talk to, even though I'd still be lonely. Um, but when I went to church, I just thought, all oh, these people have got their lives together, you know. I felt I wasn't good enough, I was ashamed, just because I had a failed marriage, and I just thought, you know, I wouldn't be good enough to go with any church with these people, they're all there with their husbands and their family families, and here's me, like, on my own with my two daughters. But really, none of us is perfect. Um, you know, church is a hospital for sinners, and by the stripes we're healed. Um, my daddy and my mum and daddy, they were very good to me. Um, my daddy, daddy he always knew whenever I was feeling down. And he, he'd watch for me come and give, give me a big hug. Just, he just seemed to know, you know, as daddy's do, they just know when you're not feeling great. Right. Um, but this, they would really have kept my kids for me so as I could have with my friends. But then I had to come to an empty house because they would have kept the kids for night for me. And it was just, it really was a good time. And I just thought, I'm never going to get through this. How am I ever going to get rid of this feeling? This lonely, lonely feeling. It was just awful. And just used to get into bed at night and used to think, oh, this is awful. I can get through the night. I can get through the bed. But I did it got through. So my sister Kim, she got saved in January 2009. And she had heard about an alcohol course in the Donald Dalen. And I said, I'll go with you just to support you on the first night. And then once you meet people, then I don't have to go back. So I loved it and I kept going. The people I worked with, they know that I love food. So every Thursday morning, I used to go out and used to say, well, what did you get to eat last night? <clears throat> but for a few weeks, I've been feeling really upset. I couldn't sleep. Didn't know what was wrong with me. It's just like running about now. But I didn't realise I was under conviction too. Um, so on Wednesday, the 8th of April, 2009, I got out of, that, out of bed that morning and I sang the song, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I just knew that it's going to be my day, this is going to be my day. Um, so I walked to the Donald Dalen Church that night. Um, I was on my own because my sister was on holiday for a week change. Um, so I said to myself, whoever sat that door, I'm going to ask me to pray with me. And it was one of my friends who I had been at all through school with, and he met me at the door. Um, I'm so glad it was him because felt he knew me and I knew him so well, so he prayed with me and I got saved. So I was just so full of joy. Just couldn't wait to phone everybody to tell me, just wanted the whole world to know. I got saved, it was from my last and met some girls who I knew and was like, you have to get saved, it's a mess feeling, you'll never be like this. So the lonely thing went away, so I just felt like I'm on top of the world, just the lonely thing, life was good. So about a year and a half after that, as I say, my daddy took sick and it was cancer. Um, <coughs> sorry. About five days before he died, he got me to marry Fury. And me, my mummy, and my sister, Maddie and Kim, we were able to stay with him the whole time. We sang the hymns and played gospel CDs. And we were all together again, just as we family died. It was just like, as we were growing up, you know, we were all together again. But after my daddy died, I got really angry with God and I was like, why did you take my daddy away? This is the only man I've ever truly loved and you take him away from me. But I knew I was always going to go back to church and I knew my daddy had been going mad that I had stopped going to church. So I came back, Pastor Stephen then had started in the Elam and I went and I met Pastor Stephen and I remember him saying, he said, I haven't been at church. And for ages, he said, well, I'm only starting here. Come on, we can do this together. So I said, right, that's it, I'm going back to church. So it turned out that we started a roaming church in East Point. And Pastor Stephen, of course, 
these high transfer. Transfer station's mommy was a lady whose house I had went to when I had first got to see it as a wee girl. You know, it was like, oh my goodness, a rentable for the start up. Um, and me and my ex-husband are now friends, which is a miracle in itself. <laughs> um, and we can talk, we've got the kids, we've got grandchildren and all, so, you know, <coughs> just we get on okay now. Um, but none of this would have happened because I was filled with a whole lot of bitterness and to be honest, I was filled with a whole lot of hate and rage for him. But, you know, I have to forgive because bitterness really eats you up inside and so always forgive me for all the things that I have done wrong. So I have to forgive him. Um, but I mean, things are good. So, um, I suffer from anxiety, which isn't so big. Um, and just before COVID, I had to leave work because I just wasn't, I just couldn't cope really very well. Um, but even though I've left work, God has always provided for me. He's never let me down. Um, so many times, God has had his hand on me, you know, taking me away from people and situations that weren't good for me. Um, sorry, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, I said it every day, um, but because God, died on that cross for me. He's taken away my sins. I have peace in my life, although the times there's that the anxiety just washes over my head. But I just call out to God. Um, there's sometimes I can't even pray, but I'll just call out his name and I know he hears me and I know he always answers me. Um, the only feeling that it has gone away, although I do have anxiety, but it's a completely different feeling. Um, the only regret is that I didn't get saved sooner in my life. Sorry, I didn't when I was seven, just keep going to church and just stay safe. Um, so I have two daughters, um, Asia, who lives in Liverpool, and she has two wee girls. And then my daughter, India, she has one wee girl. Um, she, last year, she just had a wee boy, so that's a new man in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I know my mommy and daddy, they prayed for us all their lives, so now I'm doing the same for my daughters. And if you don't mind keeping them in your prayers. Um, I just have a wee verse that I always say, and it's Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. And this is what I do whenever I feel the anxiety taking over me. Um, so that's really it. And I've got the choir. So um, thank you all for listening, and I hope God richly blesses you all. Thank you.
something that um, I thought the Lord said to me to show me here tonight, and um, it's been said over your life more than once about the waters run deep. And you've taken out of that that somehow you are so deep within yourself that you can't love and can't be understood. I just thought God said tonight he wants to liberate you, he knows you. And he made you to love. And he made you to do that. And as your creator, he is pleased with you and he loves you. Hear what he says of your life, not what others have said. He knows your heart. And he knows your heart. Can we pray? Father, as we come now to look at your word together, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak into our heart and our minds and our souls. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come and encourage these your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to let you in into a wee bit of insight into your pastor's life. Now you know most of you think all we do all day is drink coffee. Yeah. Uh, talk to people. Uh, and, uh, but you know, sometimes our weeks don't go the same way as we would desire them. And we can have weeks where I can be, you literally don't know if you can keep your head out of water. And um, I want to say this, if you belong to this assembly or this church here, will you get behind your pastors? Will you get behind Gordon? Will you get behind Janice as they love you? I can't do what I do without the people that we have in this room tonight. We're a team. And nothing ever happens with somebody unless these guys turn up and set the stage and manage physically, spiritually, in many ways for me to do the ministry that I do. They are such a support and such an encouragement. The scripture says, you know, to encourage your pastor, to honor your pastor. And you know, you will make your pastor's life much more easier. If you get in behind them and pray for them and try and take some of the administration away from them to allow them to do the work of ministry. And you need to pray a double portion of your pastor. Because if he's working full time as well and doing this ministry, that is a lot. So get behind them and really, really support them. Because you know in the ministry, it can only take one thing to change in a week, and that was not due for the whole of the week. And I had one of those weeks last week or the week before, and I know some of you have shared this with already. But we had a funeral on the Friday in church. And normally, Fridays and Saturday are my study days. They're the days I get before the Lord and prepare the Word for a Sunday morning. But I had a funeral to do on the Friday. And you know, I will never ever get my head round sitting with someone that you love and you're organising what's going to be said at their funeral. So it was going to be a tough one because of the relationship that I had with the dear lady. And then on the funeral was the Friday, and then on the Saturday again, my day for studying, we were at a leaders' conference all of the day. And I'm thinking in my head, not about Friday and Saturday, even though, you know, during the week I'm doing visitation and organizing other meetings and doing lots of other stuff. But I'm always thinking ahead to think about what we're going to be preaching on on Sunday and thinking that through the head. But Fridays and Saturdays of the day, I really double down and I try and get the word written over those couple of days. But I had one of those weeks where honestly, by Friday afternoon, because we had a women's weekend that weekend as well, and I didn't want to carry on the series of questions that we were doing, and I thought we need to do something different, and I didn't have. It's a theological term I'm about to use, a scooby doo <laughs> about what I was going to preach on Sunday morning. Now, I remember years ago saying to one of my pastors, and I was only 14 when I started to preach, and I remember saying to the pastor in those days, how come sometimes you get a word like that, and there's other times it's so hard to get? I remember saying to me, son, 
the Lord sometimes wants you to do a bit of digging. And often that's why we're in the study and we're researching and we're looking at God's word. And then there's other times I think the Lord's response to surprises. I remember one time in the Bible college going to a service and the young lad that was traveling with me, he was leading the meeting and I was preaching and he said, I want to see what he preached on instead of saying when he got there. I had in the game one of those experiences where I didn't know what I was going to do. On the Friday after this funeral, and, and again here's an insight into the pastor's heart. You know, when you marry someone you love and you care for, oftentimes when you stand by and you pour out your heart, it can take an impact on you spiritually as well and emotionally. And on the way back from the funeral service, a dear, dear friend of mine, who's a pastor in Scotland, rang me, and he said, I'm not lovely, bro, he all hates someone. Uh, he's got to read them. He's not Pakistani, he's got to read them. <laughs> I said, we all need some. And we started this conversation. He said, how did it go? And asked me about it. He said, you know, Tommy, I thank the Lord. God was with me. I felt this grace. We were able to minister to the family and all the rest of it. But I'm panicking now. I'm on a conference all day tomorrow. And I haven't got a clue that the Lord wants me to say to somebody to the, the church. You know, all our ladies are away. What? I haven't got a clue what I've done. And I said, well, maybe the Lord will give you inspiration for people to the conference the next day. So the next day we went to the Tobar conference and Pete Gray from 247, who you know from the Alpha course, if you've done the Alpha course, Pete Gray was there speaking powerfully on invoking and provoking God. It was amazing, it was such a good word. And then after he spoke, Charlotte Curran got up, who's the pastor at CFC in Belfast, and she shared an amazing word about Mar Mar Mary and Martha. And it was really, really good. But you know something, as much as I was blessed and encouraged and learned so much through that, it wasn't either of those sermons that gave me an inspiration. But at the very end of short time, she was literally so honest as she brought that preach to an end. And she just stood up the very way and she said, do I don't even know where to go with this now? The press was gone, was so thick in the room. It was an amazing time. And she said, I don't really know where to go with this. But she asked four people to minister and song. Could I maybe get just my phone there? And as I'm asking you, can I get my phone? It looks like my son's really nice. <laughs> See these pastors, I don't know. He should be in church instead of around me. I think that's not to think. But she asked for the song to be, to be sung. I have a hear of the phone. And it was during this song, as it was sung, that I really felt God's inspiration. And I am the most least tactical person you will ever meet in your life. But the song is song, He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy, when all of a sudden I am aware of these afflictions, eclipsed by your glory, and I realize how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And we are his portion, and he is our prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. And it was this next line. And as soon as they sung that next line, I knew what I had to speak on. And I want to bring that message to you tonight as well. It was this. If his grace is an ocean, we are sinking. If grace is an ocean, we are sinking. Do you know, and we sing the old hymn, Amazing Grace, but tonight do you really know how amazing God's grace is? Grace is God's favour towards the unworthy. Another way of putting it is, it's God's benevolence on the undeserving. Do you know we are so unworthy of God's merit favour upon our lives and yet today he chooses us to show us his favour. Now the funeral that I did last Friday or Friday week ago the lady I've known her from was about 14 years of age when we were in church together and as soon as I rekindled that relationship with her years after being away in Scotland and down county down south county down ministering there and all of those things, after not seeing her for a long, long time, she was at this stage of grandmother. 
And I could tell from the very first day we met, there was one grandson in particular who was definitely her favourite. And do you know how I knew? She just kept talking about him. <laughs> her favourite, her boy, her little. And it made me think, and our church family knew about this, I have a, I have a testimony, it's a wee bit like Timothy. Because like Timothy of old, I have a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And both of them were with the Lord in heaven. And it was lovely to hear that testimony of our wee Helen sharing our wee home in Valley Bay, opening the doors for the children to share uh, the gospel. But see, my wee granny, let's just put it this way. There was no doubt, there was three of us. Two sisters who are twins that are older than me, the terrible twins, lovely nomads, and then me. I was the wee boy. Well, I was my granny's favourite. I walked into the room, we Granny Lily's face would just light up. I was the love of her life. I was thinking about this today, actually. There's a photograph somewhere, and it's the day my sister got married, Marina, and I gave Marina away. We want her family. I gave my sister away. I was only 16, you know, hardly shaven, and there I am, giving my sister away. And there's a photograph of me standing between my mum and my granny. And my wee grandma's looking up at me like this. <laughs> and she said, how's my boy? That's my son. She just loved me. And you know something? You don't say anything about her wee sleeping. I was telling her this story. Uh, I'm nearly embarrassed to tell the story, but I'm going to tell you it anyway. But I was in the first church in Scotland. Um, it was a new church. They'd never heard of the denomination I worked for. And oftentimes when they heard my accent, the reply was, Okay, Father O'Neill. Okay. <laughs> they heard the Irish accent and automatically they thought I was the local priest. Or they often thought we were an American church. So when they came to get their own building, we paid with four or five different buildings and we actually bought our own building and we were doing the opening of the building, I thought in my you know, stupidity or it was wisdom or what, these people need to know that we're a God fighting church. So I decided, and in the denomination I used to work for, we worked out into the dog collars. But do you know something? I know dog collars sometimes can put up a barrier between people, but there's times when they're really useful. When I was 23, 24, going on the dining ward, it was very useful. Because <laughs> I normally got, oh, somebody can't come in to see your mama. You know? <laughs> Or when I was getting into prison, I always wore one. I was always afraid they would hear it was from Valley Bend and they would let me out again. <laughs> a collar was used for And I thought, well, if this article, the local paper's going to do about their church, if I wear a collar, then hopefully people will realise that we're a proper church and we're not a cult. So anyway, that went the, the, the thing. And my granny got to see this photograph of not when we do that we really had to have a framed photograph of her grandson wearing the colour. I honestly used to thank my granny, only for the fact that granny was from the Shankill Road, but my granny used to say mass in front of that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and the home, you see the Pope up in the wall. I used to think of that, I used to say, I need to take that down for him and never see that photograph. But nothing would do that we really would have her grandson up in the wall. But we have a family friend, I mean, he is, he, he, honestly, he's such a turn. But he would come with my mom to see my granny, and he would start winding up with her. And he would say to my granny, look at him up there, I've got to read him out tonight. Uh, he's some character, he is. I bet he's put his hand on the up and every Sunday. <laughs> well, we really would start, don't you say that about our Steve, and our Steve's a good man. Don't you dare say anything about our Steve. And she would go to the doctor tonight, and nobody would have shanked him over the lady But you know the reality of it is, Stephen's not a good man. I know my faults. I know my failures. And it's not funny that the people that we really love in our lives, because we love them so much, we try to hide sometimes who we really are from them. The two sisters were recently, um, oh, well, my sister Linda was over home. And we had them and their husbands down for me, our house, we were sitting around the table. And just like you mentioned earlier on about the antiques, maybe you and your sisters get up to, I heard for the first time some of the antiques that my two sisters get up to when they were at college. And I sat back and thought to myself, that's why I was my granny's favourite. These two are terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I was always favourite. But those 
Satan from our lives, we would hide the worries that we want. And sometimes we think we need to hide those things from the Lord as well. But here's the news for us. He's only present. He was there when you get up to the worst day of your life. He's only seen. In other words, he's all knowing. He knows every single thing about you. But here's the amazing thing. He still chooses to show you his favor. He has still set his sight upon you and he desires to show you his favor. It's immense. That's why I thought the song was amazing. If it was water, we would be drowning in it. It's a grace for us, it's so amazing. And tonight I want to share something with you, but we like for time, three things about the grace of God. Here's the first one. It's grace to save us from our sin. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. I'm speaking about Charlotte Carlin, and I always love when you go to service and somebody's preaching, and you might have heard the sermon topic before so many times, but then you learn something there, see something new in a different way for the first time. And she talked about how Jesus took off his outer garment to wash the disciples' feet. And she connected the garment of Christ with the power of Christ. Do you remember the story where the lady would have reached out to touch the hem of his garment and was healed? For people in those days, often Christ's garment was almost like his power. But in that moment and in that time, he, for them in their eyes, really took off his power and he was really himself with them. He was just Jesus. And he was given himself to them as a servant, as a friend, to wash their feet. He was offering his whole self. And just like when he went to the cross and they took his garments off him and they left him naked, basically God was saying, I'm giving you all that I have left for you. And by doing so, he was giving us his unmerited favor to save us from our sin. In church just now on Sunday morning, we're in a series in the book of Colossians. Often I will teach a book of the Bible at the time. And we're looking at Colossians. And I just love this. I can't get away from it. I want to share a reading from first um, Colossians with you this, this afternoon and this evening. And verse 15 of chapter 1 says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I want to stop there just a wee moment and interject. You come here in the night and you think your wee words fall apart. Can I just tell you there's one that's actually holding you together? Some of you are dreading getting to work tomorrow. Some of you are dreading actually putting the key in the door tonight because you don't know what you're going home to. Let me just tell you what God said here. He's holding you together. There's more behind you than you than against you today. He's holding you together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell on him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He died to make peace between the Father and us. Now listen to these words. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm not move from the hope held in the gospel. God's unmerited favor upon you meant he died on the cross to show you his grace. When you didn't deserve it, he showed you his grace. And here we see how he presents us. He presents us as holy. 
I remember when I was a wee boy, who he was, a man wearing a black suit, a black tie, and a big bag of laundry sack, and looking as miserable as him. That was holiness. But we've since learned that holiness is actually being set apart under God. I've shared this with the church family. I remember it being a wee family that I bought me my first guitar. And I remember when you gave me the money going to the music shop to buy that guitar, I remember saying in my own heart that day, see this guitar, it will never be used to play secular music. I will only play gospel music on this guitar. What was it doing? I was setting it apart for God. And in God's grace, he says about us, you're going to be set apart for me. You are holy to me, set apart. That same you're special to God. He shows us his favor. We also learn in this passage that it says, we are without blemish and spotless. Now I don't know about you, but I know me. And I just said it a minute ago, I know there's times I am not right. And I have done wrong things in the eyes of the Lord. But he has given us what's called a robe of righteousness. That when that goes around us, he doesn't see us. He sees the Lord Jesus. That's how we say spotless and special to heaven. Is that not grace? Of merited favor? I love this next thing. He gives us freedom from every act. Musician. There's many one could knock up this meet in the night and rob that door and say, Why did that one boy preach in the night? Because he did this and he said this and he did the other. But do you know something? Because of character, because of God's grief, I can get the Lord to answer the door and the Lord says, That's nice, son. That's covered. That's dead. Right. Because of God's great favor. We've learned another passage in Colossians in chapter 2 and it's in verse 13 and 14 and I want to read this to you from J.D. Phillips um, rendering of scripture and it says as he has forgiven you all your sins Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments were always hung over your heads and is completely unloved by nailing it over his own head on the cross. Now, if you're here tonight, and maybe you're not normally a church one person, you probably still have seen an Easter movie. And in Easter movies, you always see that there was a wee sign here over the Lord Jesus' head, and all it simply was, Jesus came on you. And the only thing they could get on Jesus was that he was the king of the Jews. Now, the significance of this is this. When you did something in Roman times and they were crucifying you, whether you had murdered or stolen or were in love or whatever, the sign you put up above your head was murder. Faith. And what the scripture is telling is, because of God's grace, see that list of things that you know you have done in your life. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he took that and was nailed to the cross for you, is it not grace? Is it not unmerited favor that he would take everything that you've done in your life and he would nail it to the cross? That is unmerited favor. Now here's the second thing. My take the time. Here's the second thing. Grace that blesses. Grace that blesses. So I have a wee moment myself here. Uh, my son does an amazing impersonation of my mother, his granny, who's going to be with the Lord. And as I say, my granny and mum were from the shanty. And my mum was the only person who could say, God bless. <laughs> and he would still be threatened. <laughs> but God does bless. I'm going to let you enter high. God bless it. I'm sorry, church, for you know, we've been here this morning as well in our service. But, you know, this morning we looked at the, the prodigal brother, actually, this morning, church. And last Sunday we looked for a few moments about the prodigal sons. And you probably know the story. The young man goes to his father and he asks his father for his money as inheritance. That was a real slap on the face to that father. Do you know why? You only got the house when the father died. And this boy was said to his daddy, you're dead to me. That was some slap in the face. You're dead to me. 
And he takes his inheritance, we know from later on in the passage that he squanders it in wide living. And then this young Jewish man finds himself in a pigsty, somewhere a Jewish man should have never been because of the law. And we read in Luke 15, verse 17, and I shared this this morning from the NIV, the Northern Ireland version. The ordinary version says he came to his senses, but in the Northern Ireland version it said he called his uncle. Yeah? There he is in this way thinking, tell my father's slaves are free to die. I have no food, I'm starving, and then the food is left over. And he starts to rehearse the story. He's going to go back to his daddy. He's going to say to his daddy, daddy, I'm sorry for what I've done. I deserve to be your son anymore. If you could only let me be one of your servants. And there's a lovely part in verse 20 that says, as he was far off, the father ran to the son. Now there's great significance in that, folks. You know it was not etiquette in those days for a Jewish man to run. Women ran, children ran, but not a man. But he loved his son so much, he lifted up his clothing. He didn't bury your legs as a man, but he bore his legs and he ran to his boy and he kissed him in the mouth. And the wee boy starts to rehearse the story to I have done so well. Just let me be your slave instead of your son. And what does the father do with compassion? And he wants to do for each and every one of us in this way. But I, the father calls for the robe. Put a robe around him. Do you remember the robe of righteousness? We spoke about it a minute ago. How he covers us with this robe of righteousness. That no longer sees our sin. But he just sees us. The father put his robe around the son. And he couldn't see the stench or the state as we boy was in. But he covered him over with that robe of righteousness. That's grace, isn't it? Not only did he cover him with this robe, he then calls for a ring to be put on his finger. And the wee boy said, Daddy, I'll just be your servant. Daddy, I'll just serve you. I'll be one of your hard men. And the daddy says, no, go get him a ring. What's the significance of the ring? And those days when somebody sees a letter, they show their authority by putting their ring into the wax on the letter. It was their authority that their word was true. And here this father says to his wee boy, show him this, you've got a ring back in your finger. And then the daddy says, go and get a wee pair of shoes. <clears throat> What's the significance of that? Daddy, I'll be your slave. Daddy, I'll just be your hard hand. I can't be your son. Slaves went barefooted. Sons wore shoes. And here the compassionate, gracious heart of the dad put shoes back on the son's foot, kills the father cow, and they celebrate. That is grace. After such a slap on the face, that is the grace of the Father. And you know, many a time in our lives, we have slapped the Father's face. By rejecting him, by pushing away, by misunderstanding his love, and yet all the time, he shows us his favour. There's your little back. There's your authority back. There's the shoes to walk in as my child and my son. We've all been to weddings. We've all been, if you want to call them, baptism, christenings, dedication, everything, blessing, whatever you want to call them. We've been to weddings. And often we'll hear the ironic blessing from Numbers, and it says, As the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance towards you, and the Lord give you. And friends, we talk about not being a blessing, but do we get what we really say? Do we get that it's actually said when we say the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you, he said there is nothing that will separate you from my love, as we read about in Romans chapter 8. He goes on to say the Lord make his face to shine upon you. We grandly love it. Every time I would walk down the road, my wee face would have let up, there's my son. That wee photograph of the wedding day with my sister looking up at me going, there's my boy. You know, it's not only the father loves us. And maybe this is a bit of a spiritual insight for you, but actually the father likes you too. 
His countenance rises when he sees you. He smiles when he sees you. I know sometimes we walk into the room and there's some people that turn their backs on us or they hide from us. But when we come before the Lord, his countenance rises before us. He's gracious to you. He shows favor. The Lord lifts his countenance upon you and give you peace. Not just the absence of war. But when everything is falling apart in your life, he gives you his inner stillness that we heard about in that testimony this evening. And he wants to bless us. That's grace. Grace that saves and also the grace that will bless us. And just the word of time will be believed that I can go to our last one. And then there's the grace that surprises. Paul the Apostle said this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you in my, uh, in my in your weakness is made perfect, in my, or sorry, uh, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is a time in the Apostle Paul's life where he says he has a thorn in his flesh, sent by the enemy, suffering the annoyance. Now, you better on stay in the house. Everybody ever have a thorn in their hand or we really scared? So is that? Might be tiny, but it's really annoying. And here the Apostle Paul said that there was something said of the enemy to annoy him, to hurt him. And over the years, there's been many people who have written many articles about what they thought the thorn in the flesh was, and it's just as a wee free bit of information. If you want to read a good book on the thorn in the flesh, R.T. Kendall's Thorn in the Flesh, which is amazing. And there are so many people who have said different things. Some people thought it was temptation. Remember, Paul did say, the things that don't want to do, do, and the things that I should do, don't do. He's quite honest when he spoke about that. It could have been a temptation. We also know that sometimes Paul maybe have a problem with his eyes. And he says, do you see the big letters that I use as I write to you? In another part of scripture, he said, if someone who loved him, would you have to give their very eyes for him? Some thought it was malaria. Some people thought he was bothered from time to time with um, depression, or it could have been a speech impediment for Paul, or it might have even been a person. Alexander the coppersmith has done me good harm. And we know the three times the Apostle Paul says to the Lord, will you take this away from me? He prays to the Lord, will you take this away from me? But God's of the favor says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My blessing, my presence, my all being upon you is sufficient for me and you have to walk. As I said earlier, I don't know what you're going back home to. Maybe as you put the key in the door, I remember taking a, a lady home from church one Sunday night many moons ago. I watched her wee hand shake. I should put the key in the door. And none of us at that stage really knew what was behind that door that we really was doing or what's happened to that lady. I don't know your situation, can I? I don't know what you're fearful of. I don't know what you're going through just now. But what I do know is this. His grace is sufficient. His grace will meet you there. His grace will take you through. His unmerited favour, even though you might think tonight you don't deserve it. For whatever reason that God only knows, He looks at you and He loves you. He looks at you and He favours you. He looks at you and He loves you. And He wants to bless you. God's unmerited Favor. Are you trying? Are you realizing how immense God's grace is upon you? 
I know the church family here in East Point tonight. I know we always saw them a bit dubious, but I do know. <laughs> but I don't know the rest of you here. I don't know the stand with God. But can I say this to you? If you've never experienced God's grace, can I encourage you to open up your heart to Him and allow Him to show you His amazing favor? If you are a child of God, know today that the Lord does want to bless you quite simply because the Lord not only loves you, but He likes you. And He means well for you. And wants you to be blessed. And whatever you're going through today, whatever you're going through tonight, whatever follows you in the quiet hour of the night, God's word tells you that His favor, His being, His presence is sufficient for what you're going through. So friend, tonight, whoever you are, whatever you want to do, can you be blessed? As we want to bring this to an end, the worship team will just come and be as the final song of worship. Can I just pray on the prayer blessing? I want to pray for our blessing in our lighthouse church. Lord, will you bless John? Lord, as they pastor this church, will you give them wisdom? Will you give them strength? Will you give them their courage? Will you anoint them? And Father God, I pray that you will give them much, much blessing in their lives and ease to do this work of ministry. And I pray the church family will bless them, encourage them, and stand with them. We pray over this building that it truly will become a lighthouse. We pray for this building and its people that they will flourish, that they will grow, that they will develop their giftings and their desire to serve you. And I pray that the anointing of God, the sweet aroma of God, will move in this building. I pray even this week that when other users come to use this building, they will be attracted to the aroma of Christ as we left here tonight. And that they would see men and women, boys and girls, come in from this area to give their lives to Jesus and be a part of this community and this church. Lord, bless the family of God at Lighthouse Church and their leadership. Every song
We thank you for your amazing, amazing grace, Lord. We don't deserve it. And yet you give it to us anyway. And so, Lord, tonight we pray. Touch our lives. Lord, we pray that you would minister to everyone that's come through these doors tonight. Lord, that you would make that difference. You would reveal yourself. Remind us how much we're loved. Remind us, Lord, what our inheritance in you is. And oh Lord, what your amazing offer of salvation is to everyone. So Lord, bless us and bless this supper and bless East Point Church as we just thank you, Lord, for the ministry that we've received from them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I just want to go to any more. Lord, 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 I just want to thank you to follow Jesus or how you can make a difference. Please speak to Pastor Stephen. Speak to me. Amen. Amen. Amen.